initial discussion about the chemistry of air and the first thing we need to talk about is just what we mean by the air around us and if you think about earth as shown right here we are all on the surface of earth and so the atmosphere that includes the air that we're breathing that's what we call the troposphere further away from earth you're going to go into these other layers of the atmosphere of earth all the way to the axosphere now in terms of the air around us there are a number of these gases that exist, nitrogen being the most abundant of all of these gases. The amount that you inhale is about 74%. Oxygen is about 21% in air, it's also about 21% being inhaled. And then carbon dioxide and argon are in much smaller quantities. Now notice that the amount that you exhale for nitrogen is the same, which really means that you're not really using nitrogen for anything. So you breathe it in, you breathe it out again. Okay, but oxygen, you breathe it in 21%, but the ones that's breathed out is much less in terms of proportion. And that is because some of the oxygen is actually used in what we call cellular respiration to generate energy in your body. The product of that chemical reaction is carbon dioxide. So that's why the quantity of carbon dioxide relatively speaking, increases by a lot in the exhaled air. The percentage here is percentage by volume, which just means that you have a hundred liter of air, 74% of that is nitrogen. So it's 74 liters. Another way to think about this is if you imagine there's a hundred particles of air, there's 74% nitrogen. That means that 74 of these pores is going to be filled with nitrogen particles. Now CO2 is a small quantity, but it's actually what we call a greenhouse gas and will trap the sun's heat near the earth's surface and that causes problems. It heats up the earth more than what we would like it to be uh, in natural processes. Oxygen is a really key gas for our survival. There's a lot of things that we need oxygen for, including to produce energy using the food that we eat. Oxygen is also needed for a lot of other chemical reactions. Like anytime you burn anything, something we call combustion, oxygen is needed and rusting occurs because of oxygen. Now, before we can go further talking about some of the pollutants in the air around us, we really need to know how to recognize and name some of these molecules that we'll see. There's three different types of things that we need to know how to name and we really need to memorize this. In those elements, that's kind of the letters. Now you're starting to combine the letters to make words. So this is what this naming part of this chapter is all about. So we're going to start with something called covalent molecules. Those are compounds. They're formed by non-metal elements and they're joined together using covalent bonds. These are some examples here. As you can see, they're all non-metal. So they're all on the right side of the periodic table phosphorus, oxygen, nitrogen, selenium, and so on. Many of these compounds exist naturally as gases in the air, and that's the reason why we care about them in this chapter, because we want to know what their roles are in air. Now, the way we name these covalent molecules is as follows. They all have two different elements to them, so like a nitrogen and oxygen, phosphorus and chlorine, and so on. So you name the first nonmetal, which is the nonmetal to the left, and you just name that by its elemental name. And then you name the other nonmetal by also by its elemental name, but then you have to end it with IDE. And then you're going to have to attach some prefixes. So the prefixes would be representing how many of that element exists in the formula. So mono would represent one, di, two, tri, three, and so on as listed on this table. You want to memorize these prefixes and know what they correspond to. The only exception if mono is the prefix for the first element, then you don't include them. Okay, so let's take a quick example here, Se2Cl2. So hopefully you've memorized your elements. You know that Se is selenium and then Cl is chlorine. Selenium and then chlorine. But as we said earlier, the ending of that name has to be IDE for the second element. So therefore this has to be changed instead of chlorine becomes chloride. That's not the end of it though. We have to attach those prefixes. Prefix for two, which is di, so then it would be called diselenium. And then there's also two chlorine involved, so it's dichloride. So then the complete name for this is diselenium dichloride. I want you to try that second one there, Cl207 on your own. Another one here that's a little unique, PCL3, phosphorus, 
for P and Cl becomes chlorite. There's only one phosphorus, it's mono. But remember that if mono is the prefix for the first element, you don't write it. So then you jump to the second one. Three is tri, so phosphorus trichloride. Let's do CO, carbon oxide. First one is mono, but remember that if it's the first prefix, we don't write it, so we just leave it as carbon. And then the second one is also mono, and if it's the second one, you do have to write it, so then it just becomes monoxide. Carbon monoxide, but of course you know this to be just carbon monoxide, okay? Very common gas that you probably have heard of. And the reason is because a lot of times when people do have these two O's right here, they tend to just combine them and make them into one just to have it easier pronounced. Okay, so you see that whenever you have an OO or an AO in the names, they would just become O. Now you can also go from the name to the formula. So for example, dinitrogen trioxide. Okay, so let's try that. So again, we look at the element first, it's nitrogen. And then oxide, N and O is the first thing we need to write. And then we look at the prefixes. Di means there's two nitrogen, so N2. And then tri means there's three oxygen, N2O3. And then we just need to make sure those are subscripts, okay? All right, I think you should be able to do all the other ones, but ask questions if you're not clear. It turns out that there's another way uh, that these non-metal elements can come together and they don't form a covalent molecule but they form something called a polyatomic ion. So we need to define what these terms mean. Okay, so ions is different than an atom. So we've talked about atoms so far. We also talk about molecules. So atoms are neutral. Remember, the number of protons and electrons are equal to each other. Molecules is a string of these atoms. They're attached together through chemical bonds. For example, those covalent molecules that we just talked about, something like this. That's an example of a molecule. It has a bunch of atoms stuck together. Ions is an atom that has lost or gained electrons. Remember that electrons is part of an atom, but it's kind of circling around in the atom, and you can either gain them or lose them. Items, so that's what electrons are like uh, in an atom. So the neutral atom has exactly the same number of protons and electrons. The ions will have a different number of electrons and protons. So we define two types of ions, cations, are atoms that have lost electrons, okay? Electrons are negatively charged. The cations are positively charged. Anions, on the other hand, are atoms that have gained electrons. So if anions are also negatively charged. Now, when the ion is formed from just one atom, we will call it a monoatomic ion. So let's take a look at sodium. Sodium originally is just the atom. If you look at the number of protons in the atom state, it has 11 protons and 11 Electron. So if it loses that one electron, so just think about that a little bit, right? Normal sodium atom is 11 protons, 11 electrons. And then sodium ion has 11 protons, but only 10 electrons because it's lost that one electron. This is what we call a monoatomic ion because it only has one element in it. Okay, mono, remember, means one. There's a bunch of monoatomic ions. The easy way to remember some of these is by remembering that whatever group number the atom is, that's the same as the charge of the cations. Okay, so here's group one. And you can see all the group one ion are plus one. So they have a positive one charge. All the group two ion have plus two. And then you see here group 13 has plus three. Now you might say, well, 13 shouldn't need plus 13. We can think of this 13 as minus 10. And so there's really three in there. So that's a plus three. These three, group one, group two, and group 13, are the three that will form cations. With anions, they are atoms that have gain electrons. So chlorine, the atom phase, has 17 protons and 17 electrons. Chlorine, because it's a non-metal, it could accept electron. If it accepts one electron, it becomes this guy. It's an ion that has one more negative charge, so it's called Cl minus. Okay, so you see that this is Na plus, this is Cl minus. Now, once you go to group 15, 16, 17, 
they become anions. Non-metals tend to form anions, metal tends to form cations. So then how do you know what charge they form? It turns out that they have very predictable behavior, just like the cations. You can see that the entire periodic table, there's 18 groups. The last one, which is called the noble gases here, is group number 18. So the way you remember the nonmetals is by subtracting the group number by 18. Okay, so if you subtract 17 minus 18, you get negative 1. So all of those guys have negative 1 charge. 16 minus 18 is negative 2, so these are all have negative 2 charge. Okay, so that's how you kind of remember what kind of charges exist. Ions could be formed by these elements, but it's also possible that a molecule could also lose or gain electrons. When that happens, we call it a polyatomic ion. Now why poly? Poly means many. So it's because in the ion, there is more than one atom, okay? For example, NO2 minus. So NO2, there's three different atoms here, right? One nitrogen, two oxygen. This is the NO2 molecule that has gained one extra electron. We don't give them the same name because they're not the same thing. That's one of the things that's really hard for students at the beginning level to understand. They might look very similar when you write them, but they're not, they're different. So you have to call them different names too, right? So NO2, you already learned how to name this. This is a covalent molecule, it has non-metals only. So this is nitrogen dioxide. NO2 minus, this is no longer a covalent molecule, has its own name, this polyatomic ion the only way to know their name is to memorize them. So NO2- is called the nitride ion, N-I-T-R-I-T-E ion, okay? As I said just now, polyatomic ion names must be memorized, and so here's a, a short list of polyatomic ions that you can memorize. There's a lot more than this, but for this class, we don't really want to get too deep. 